Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm chatting with Sarah Rainsberger. She's the docs lead at Astro.Build. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm very well. Um, you wrote a blog post uh, a while back called The Value of Non-Code Contributions to Open Source. And I really like the way it opened because you didn't mince words. You came right out and you said, I've heard people speak dismissively of PRs, pull requests, that fix a typo. And that attitude may speak to docs in general. That seems like an area of passion for you. It is, yes. Working in an open source documentation project, I can tell you that we have a lot of typos and they need fixing. And if I don't have to do it, that's magical. So you will never see me dismiss the smaller contributions to docs. I've been telling people that docs are the best way, like I would even go so far as to say the number one way to get involved in open source. And I feel like when I tell them that they don't really believe me. I don't understand why. Well, it's maybe because you're telling only a half truth there. Hmm. It is a good way to get into open source. In fact, reading the docs carefully to correct these typos or figure out a way to explain something better or update a broken link or parse a code sample that maybe has an outdated value in it or isn't consistent through the page. These are all great things that can help you become more familiar with a particular open source project. In fact, we at Astro have just done an amazing run of translation releases. Astro just released our our V3 docs. And on launch day, our V3 upgrade guide was translated into four additional languages. So when dev hit boom, release, Docs hit boom release in five languages. And so, in fact, I would even go further and I would say translation is an awesome way to get into open source docs too, because the care and attention that our translators need to put into reading our English docs in order to properly interpret them, decide which is jargon that does get translated, which doesn't. They find so many of our little mistakes as well that they can then pull back to the English docs. I don't think anyone knows how to guide and support our Astro community base better than our translators. So yes, docs, yes, translations. But if I take the other spin a little bit, depending on the contributions you want to make to docs, docs is also a thing. So we don't dismiss the small typos. But at the same token, we respect the technical writers who do a lot of our docs writing and the care and attention and quality that we try to maintain in our Astro docs means that sometimes we can get drive by, I want to get started in open source contributors who say, hey, I think this paragraph sounds better like this. And that maybe doesn't endear you to an open source maintainer. So yes, docs are a great way to get in. Yes, docs are a specialized skill and craft. Yes, translations. I don't know of a single open source project that is trying to translate that doesn't want more translators involved reviewing and finding mistakes. Um, but it's a more it's a more nuanced question than just, yes, start with docs. That is really good. And, you know, I, I, it's one of those things where I knew it, but I didn't feel it quite in my chest as much. But now that you've said it, you're absolutely right. The translation is a huge opportunity, especially for emerging countries, emerging people in tech, early in career folks in tech who might think I have nothing to offer because I'm just getting started in tech. But they do, if they're bilingual or multilingual, they have a huge amount of information to offer. They can read the docs, they can try stuff out, they can find errors, and they can translate. That is a great example that you've added there. That's changed my perspective right now. And we're only five minutes in. (laughs) And in fact, some of our newest maintainers to the Astro Open Source Project started as translators, maybe without even a lot of specific Astro knowledge, but built it up through translating, through docs, through then helping in our community support forums because they know the answer they and they know exactly where it is in docs to link to it and they become our open source maintainers it's a wonderful stepping stone 
the uh, the other thing that you talk about in this blog, blog post, and I'll make sure I link to it in the show notes, is you know like installation instructions, any instruction, any documentation that isn't clear uh, means that we've lost a, a customer, we've lost a potential person who's doing that. I think we've all had the experience where I've been in docs, I've been following along closely line by line. I copy paste something directly from the docs into the command line and it doesn't work. And you think to yourself, this never could have worked. Am I the first person who has ever run this command? It might be a typo, it might be an extra this or an extra that. Just running through the documentation and trying out the instructions multiple times in multiple contexts has a lot of value as well. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I mean, we list myriad ways you can get involved with AstroDocs, legitimately helping, not just pat on the head, you know, yes, here, go maybe do this. Running through examples is absolutely one of them. Uh, They can get out of date. They could have been accurate when written, but something has changed. We have a lot of guides for how to integrate various CMSs with Astro. And if they change something on their end, we don't necessarily know. And in fact, all of this is so important. We think of open source and we think of pull requests. We think, oh, I have to go in and make a change to this code base to contribute. And that's the least of what we need. I am drowning in pull requests. Do you know what we need at AstroDocs? We need PR reviewers, reviewing PRs, even leaving a comment saying, yes, I checked this, looks good. If someone is proposing something new to Docs, that's then running through steps that I don't have to do, that my team doesn't have to do. If you can go in and say, yeah, that tracks, these instructions check out. Yes, I think that's better than the original. That you've just left a comment on a PR and that is so helpful. In fact, it is so helpful. You might not have the link handy there. We have badges. We award our community members. We've always included badges. They're based on GitHub stats. So your pull requests, you have badges when you are involved in like six different repos, things like that. We also have badges for PR reviews left. So you can level up in reviews. We have badges for translation reviews left. There are just so many ways these badges are getting kind of full. When you look at some of our contributors, there are so many ways to contribute to docs that do not involve rewriting the paragraphs that I finally crafted and throwing it unsolicited in my inbox. There are helpful ways. You just have to ask. And we've got so many tasks for you. The uh, the badges stuff is super fascinating. You you have a ton of badges yourself. There's over three thousand contributors to the Astro CMS project. Uh, uh, badges, of course, are like like Xbox achievements, and there's dozens of these. I'm actually looking at yours right now. You've got ones like Galactic Librarian and Rocket Scientist and PR Perfectionist, and these are all different tasks. These badges are really clever because it acknowledges that reviewing a PR is different work than Starting a PR is different work than reviewing internationalization PRs. And one might have a a thing that they're interested in more than another. Absolutely. So again, no shortage of ways to help. We recognize with these badges, these badges, it's embeddable code. You can copy it. You can put it on your website. You can put it on your GitHub profile. I always love surfing GitHub profiles and then seeing who has embedded their badge on their profile there. Now, if you do make a pull request, and this is this is Astro Docs in particular, because of course, Astro is JavaScript web framework for building amazing websites. We run an entirely separate documentation site, which is the repo and project that I oversee. And we have over 500 contributors just to the Astro Docs site. We have wow. over 3,000, we just passed over 3,000 contributors to Astro in general. So yes, I'm going to be talking about our non-code contributions, but I'll remind everyone you can participate in the main Astro core base as well. But AstroDocs takes it to another level. So we recognize your first time PR contributions with a wild, ridiculous shout out in the Discord. We have our first time contributor alert we ping you on Discord. We thank you for your contribution. We welcome you to Team Docs with a pun based on the name of your PR. And we haven't run out yet. We're still working hard. So our Docs team makes a real effort to make sure 
that these non-core code-based contributions just are celebrated. Like, we should be having fun. This is open source. We're working on interesting stuff. We're sharing. We're collaborating. So we try to make it fun for everybody because ultimately, you know, you are giving your time, you're giving your energy, and we just want to give some of that back to you. The focus on uh, being welcoming, on being supportive, is that a Sarah thing? Is that a Astro thing? Because you really feel like it's important to be supportive of non-code contributors who may already feel a bit of open source, low self-esteem about what they're contributing to the project. Well, fortunately, it's a Sarah thing that comes from the top down. So when I stumbled into the Astro Discord, the core members, the the founders, the initial core team, everyone is so welcoming and inclusive. You're not dismissed for asking a beginner question. Uh, They encourage you to get involved. And so when it got to the point that I took over the docs project itself as its own entity, we decided to take that to a whole other level. That that positivity that stays everywhere in the project and that, that drives things like you think people stick around more and are more likely to go, oh, wow, I'm, I like these people. This seems like a place that I want to spend time. Absolutely. Absolutely. You will find, oh, there was one post on social media that I'll never forget. And it was, I need to join another discord like I need a hole in the head. But looking at how this community treats new people just makes me want to join and just makes me want to stay. That's very cool. In the time that you've been in the open source community, have you felt that there's been more respect, like the community starting to realize the value of writers and translators and designers and testers and content creators and all the things that aren't just the core code contributors? I think we are starting to see more of that now. Hopefully, it's because more people are finding themselves able to get involved. And hopefully it's because more people are advocating for the work they do. We talk a lot about docs and writing, which extends to translating. But as you said, there are designers, there are testers, there's all kinds of work that goes on that isn't the assumed code contribution to an open source project. And I think people really are starting to value it. Docs occupies a really interesting space in open source because everybody wants them. Everybody needs them, but by and large, the people who create them are people who are more used to creating other kinds of things. So I think people are realizing as they maybe read and have a bad experience with some docs, that's our clue that this is something to be more recognized. Similarly, I mean, there's so much competition for getting your project in front of someone else's eyes. People love logos, they love graphics, they love videos to promote. So, you know, there's also the the entire world of design that you can get into as well. And I think people are realizing that if you want someone else to use your project, then you need to think about these complementary processes that can really just put it in front of people, make it easy and make it pleasurable for them to use. Did you start in Docs or did you start as a dev? What was your journey into this space? Well, my journey into this space was as someone with a crappy community choir website that wanted to make it better. And I thought maybe I need to learn a little CSS because whatever like pattern recognition going through source code, um, you know, I inherited something that was generated from a website generator at one point. So I took it upon myself. I knew some HTML from way back in the day. Uh, I was learning a bit of CSS and JavaScript. And so for me, my background was I had a problem. I had a thing I wanted to make better. When I stumbled across Astro and decided, okay, I'll try building my site in Astro. Astro was brand new at the time. I mean, we're talking two, three months, maybe. So there was no documentation. But there was a super friendly Discord community. And I was at a crossroads. I was, do I continue working with whatever this nascent project is with these amazing people? Or do I go choose a different framework and make a different website? Because there's lots of existing material. There's YouTube tutorials. There's whatever. And I don't know. Maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment. 
and said, no, let's do the exciting, out of the ordinary thing. So it just really started out in a community trying to make a website, trying to understand how it worked, reporting back when things didn't work like I expected them to. And instead of having docs to consult to figure out whether they were wrong, I had to ask the core maintainers, is this how it's supposed to work? Because there was no comprehensive documentation about how some of these features would work. And the project was super new. They weren't even sure how they wanted these features to work. Or maybe I was coming up with things they hadn't even accounted for yet. So getting involved in this project at that early stage, something else I talk about too is that docs can shape a project. So in the course of eventually starting to help in this support forum myself, once I learned these things, starting to write the documentation, if it gets to the point where I'm trying to document how something works, and it's really not going well, like it's, I'm like, oh, this is not a good story. I go to the devs and I say, you know, I really wish I could tell this story. This makes sense from a user's perspective as to do X and Y will happen. Can we make it work that way? And we have done that. We have absolutely designed some features based on docs telling the devs, look, if we can't explain it well, maybe this isn't a good design decision. That sounds like PM work, you know, program manager, product manager work. Which mean makes me wonder if like maybe the docs people have all the power, you know, <laughs> you're, 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 cause you said things like story. Like, I don't like the story here, which is a marketing thing that marketing people say. And like, I wish it worked like this, which is like a thing like a program manager would say. It seems like the people who really know the product more than anyone are the people who are writing those deep documentation pages. Well, as I usually say, I can't build Astro. But I build with Astro and I help people build with Astro. And so it's a different kind of knowledge and it's a different kind of background. But it's, it's again, some of these complementary skills and perspective that come in and really, I do think, help make a better project in the end. Yeah, that is exciting. And how long have you been doing this now since you had your choir website? I think I just passed about two years working with Astro. That includes stumbling into the Discord and finding my initial project, logging countless hours in the Discord, both asking questions, answering questions, getting to be a familiar face because I guess I just had too much time and too many questions and I wasn't satisfied with certain answers. And I mean, I guess the, the natural documentarian view is to want to understand everything. But you're a full-time employee now, right? So Astro is an open source project, but there's a company behind it and you work for them now. So this turned into a job. Correct. So for me, this did turn into, yes, an employment contract. Now it is my responsibility, not just my pleasure, but also my responsibility to lead this fabulous docs project with 500 contributors and translators and designers and testers. So for me, it was a wonderful way to walk in uh, simply as someone trying to make a website, then trying to get answers, then trying to help other people with their problems get their answers, and then realizing that I had this skill I could contribute, both in terms of writing and revamping documentation, but also in corralling just this fabulous community that we have. So all of these skills that you now have, because you came out, like you said, learning, yeah, you need to learn some CSS. In two years, you, I assume you've developed community management skills, or maybe you already had them, CSS skills. Did you, you learned Git, presumably, or did you come into this knowing Git? Actually, I was relatively new to Git as well, as I call it. In my past life, I was a mathematics teacher. So that's my background. I have a background teaching, tutoring, high school, university math. And then after a while out of career and just deciding that, okay, the, all these skills I'm using for community organizations like the community choir, where I was the communications manager, I wrote all the emails to every choir member to make sure they knew where to go each week, which music they should be rehearsing. When it was concert time, I was the one that would provide all the instructions and the directions 
here's where the concert is. When you're done, do not wander out into the crowd and say hello to your family. Hand your music in backstage first, then you are free to go. So I used to joke, if only I could get paid to write these choir emails because they they literally had tables of content. And it was, and our director too d- doesn't need to know half this stuff. So there would always be the, okay, and director may stop reading here. The rest of you need to keep going. So that energy, I think, that I had to my community projects, once I started really working on the website and then getting more into the web dev stuff of it, I, I think I just hoisted myself on the Astro community in the same way that I would with my community choir. This is really interesting because I hope that folks are listening who may not be traditional computer science, you know, people who found themselves doing open source. In this case, you were a teacher, you were a community manager, like you were literally describing your choir work as a, as a leader, you were a cat herder, getting everyone together and like all head in the same direction, that these are valuable, marketable skills. And then as a user of the web who was going to put together a website for your choir, then it, which you cared about, and this is important, I think. Do an open source project that you care about. In this case, your choir site will make you more engaged as you go and write docs because you have a thing that you care about that uses uses it, your your choir site. Uh, And that's such a key question. And it's one that I sort of get hung up on when people ask, how do I get into open source? Or here's what you do to get into open source. And the question just seems so foreign to me because I never had the intention of getting into open source. I found an open source community with a project that I cared about, with a lovely community that fulfilled a need, and I started contributing. So sometimes we jump the horse a bit if we think open source contributions are the goal. I think the goal is to get involved with something. So find, as you say, find that community that works for you. Find that project that you want to make better. Find that project that you love and you want to support and you want to ask them, what can I do to make this even better? Think of what's missing in the work that you might currently do that an open source project could help. I'm not saying it's for everybody, but for me, it was find the project first, find your community, find the people that are going to guide you and support you and do that. I really love that. And it, like, it cannot be overstated because I've had people who are early in career or thinking about getting involved in work like this, and they'll end up doing tutorials and making tic-tac-toe sample websites. And they'll say, what should I put on my portfolio? And what language should I use? And I always tell them, find a project. Maybe it's your church. Maybe it's your kid's little league. Maybe it's your Pokemon collection. Whatever it is, Make a thing. And if you find a community, a tool, a language that is exciting for that thing, make a blog, make a podcast, then that's going to dictate. It's the passion project that you're going to do first. But if you just pick a random language or a lang- random thing, like if I sat down with Astro but had nothing to build with it, I would feel lost. But if I wanted to make uh, my kids' football league, I would go and I'd start from there. And I, I love that you're, you're, you're saying the same thing. So astro.new, astro.build, astro.badges, there's a lot of astro. Where is the place that we go to learn about astro? And how do I understand the difference between the group behind it or the the open collective behind it and the open source project? Yeah, there is a lot of astro out there. So the main astro website is astro.build. That would be our marketing site. From those sites, you can get to the astro docs, you can get to astro.new, which actually then lets you click on a bunch of different templates we've provided that will open directly in an online code editor like StackBlitz or Gitpod. So you can play around with it right away. Astro badges are things that, yes, we link to from our docs and from our community. So Astro itself is an open source project and we have open collective funding. This funds the project itself it funds all our community contributors. We also have the Astro Tech Company, which is a separate private corporation that was formed to support the open source project. So with a separate company, there are some paid employees, contractors 
who work on the health of the project. But essentially, this is an open source project. The IP is open source. It's MIT licensed. Go make yourself an Astro website. You can use it. Those of us at the company are additionally putting extra work into supporting the open source project. And Astro sells itself or presents itself as an all-in-one web framework for fast, specifically content-focused websites. I found that a little bit confusing because I was thinking, well, what about React, Vue, and this and that? But if you go to astro.new, you can build Astro sites with React and with Vue and with this and with that. So how should I think about Astro? Well, you caught us at a, at a great time or the worst time because we're just in a bit of a marketing tweak with version 3 having been released. Our roots are a JavaScript static site generator content for sites. So for your blogs, your marketing sites, your portfolios, agency sites, e-commerce sites. Traditionally, that is where Astro started. They wanted to get the web right first. So with this JavaScript framework, so the cool thing in Astro is that you build it with JavaScript, but then it's all server-rendered HTML. So, Mm. you know, there's as little JavaScript as possible on the client and only when you need it. That's sort of how it evolved. If you want some interaction, then you use what we call our islands, which are components in React, Vue, Svelte. So what's interesting about Astro is that within one framework, you can have individual component islands that are an image carousel or a little interactive button, or an entire app. I mean, when I started, I'm also a bird watcher, and I had written myself a tiny little Create React app for bird watching. One of the first things I did in my Astro website was put this React app smack dab on a page, and it ran right inside Astro. So these are some of the interesting things that we're doing. I, I sometimes think of it like, what if HTML, but components? That's kind of the uh, advantage that Astro can provide. And that's where you get us talking about things like speed and lightweight, because you don't need an entire JavaScript framework to ship a static website. But you did say, how should I think of Astro? And it, it, honestly, this it, it's just so coincidental with our timing. Um, it sounds like marketing speak, but how we are thinking of Astro now with our version three features that have just gone out is we actually find it a little less limiting than our past descriptions. So we're currently in the process of trying to find the best way to explain to you that, yes, these little web apps that you can throw right on an Astro page, you can run entire apps in an Astro site. We've unlocked some JSX features that open the door to running dashboards and much more interactive content than we ever thought possible with Astro before that you can have your entire Create React app just right in the page. You can have a dashboard running. You can have some view transitions. So that's where we are. How do we envision ourselves? Well, we kind of think the sky is the limit right now. And we're just really excited getting started and getting into that. That's so interesting because I like that you said that, you know, we, we thought we knew what it was for. And then we added this extensibility feature and that extensibility feature. And now we're shocked at what people are able to do with it. So maybe it's for more than we thought it was for. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Sarah Rainsberger, for chatting with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was great. So folks can go and learn about Astro at astro.build. You can try it right now at astro.new and do it all in the browser. I was able to go and do open it in Code Sandbox, in StackBlitz, or in Gitpod, or certainly you can install it locally and give it a try yourself. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 